more than just a beautiful song to be able to sing. It's a doctrinal truth that reminds us that you are a sovereign God. That no matter what is happening in our life, it can be well with our soul because you are the one who is in control of it all. And because of your love, Father, you allow not just good things, but also difficulties into our lives that we would learn to love you and rely on you more. So, Father, I pray that we would truly learn to love you as you deserve to be loved. And that our faith would grow, not just through the, the good times, but Lord, also through the difficult times. And Father, we pray, just looking for, longing for that day in which you are going to return. Lord, help us to remember that COVID is temporary. Cancer is temporary. Hurts, heartaches, sufferings are temporary. But the kingdom of our God is eternal. And because Jesus rose from the dead, those who have placed their faith in him, though our lives on this earth may be temporary, our glory with Jesus is eternal. So Father, help us to just hang on. And to know that even if we find ourselves in a difficult season of life right now, there's a better day coming. And Lord, because of that, may we praise you and glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. And as we prepare to go into a time of studying God's word, whether you are here in uh, the room with us or you're watching on Facebook, I want to encourage you to open up your Bible app. Uh, if you have it on your phone or your tablet, and you can go to more and then search, hit events and just type in Westlake Baptist Church and click on it because there you're going to be able to see the outline that we're going to use. You're going to be able to highlight verses and take notes uh, for yourself as well. So uh, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 22 as this is going to be our second week uh, in the series, What is Church? Last week we saw that church is a called out assembly. All right, we, we have been called out of this world, called to God for salvation, but then he has sent us out to share the good news of the gospel. So as we go into a very familiar text, we have to be honest. Sometimes this is kind of hard for us to talk about. But I think one thing that every church should regularly evaluate itself on is this. Do we have a fortress mentality or a relational mentality? Now, how in the world could I possibly know? Well, here we go. A fortress mentality is about protecting who is already in. It's about protecting what we already have. A, it's being closed off to anything or anyone new. A relational mentality, on the other hand, is about forming relationships with the purpose of introducing them to Jesus or deepening their walk with Jesus. A relational mentality means we are very intentional about building relationships to point others to Jesus. It's not just about having friends. It's about having friends with a purpose. A relational mentality creates um, a safe space for believers and unbelievers to admit their struggles and to ask their hard questions. A relational mentality offers grace, mercy, and forgiveness as freely to others as God has given to us. So here's the one big thing for the morning. Our love for God is seen in how we treat Others. Let's look at it together. Matthew chapter 22. I'm going to begin at verse 34 and ask you if you can and would stand as we honor the reading of God's word together. The word of God says, But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. 
Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Father, we thank you for your word. And now, Lord God, we ask, as we humbly come before you, for admitting our need for you daily. And Lord, in this moment, as we study your word, Father, let us not come to our own conclusions. Help me not to share my own wisdom. My Father, instead, rely solely on your Holy Spirit to speak the truth of your word into our lives, that we would know you, love you, so that we can obey you. And so, Father God, we ask that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the truth of your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our love for God is seen in how we treat others. Now, again, this, this is a very familiar text, especially if you've been in church uh, for any length of time. Uh, fact of the matter, four years ago, um, I preached this exact text in a different way, but so we're familiar with it. The problem with familiar text, however, is sometimes we just kind of read through it really fast. We need to understand the, the background here so that we understand how does this text, spoken by Christ, apply to you and I. Well, the, the scribes, that lawyer that you see in the text there, they were part of the Pharisees. All right? Their job was to know the law very, very well. They would tell the people what it says and how to understand it. Well, they broke the 613 commandments up into two groups. They, they called the one the heavy commandments, which means they were really important. And then the lighter, which means less important. And what they would teach is as long as you focus on the heavy commandment, it was okay if you weren't as strict on the lighter. If you didn't try as hard. On those. This is what they were taught. So that is why Jesus says in verse 40, on these two commandments hang all the law. Jesus is saying every commandment that is given in the Old Testament is equally important. There is no division or distinction. It's why James in James chapter 2, he says if you break one commandment, you broke how many? All of them. So they are teaching us that all of God's word is important. But you know what this really shows us? This shows us just how easy it is for you and I to try to play God. To decide what's important and what's not. Think of, about your time of coming into scripture. Are there times where you think, ah, oh, that text, that really applies to me. And, and sometimes like, ah, it's not that big of a deal. See, it's so easy for you and I to want to be God and make our own choices. And, and, and we rationalize our decisions. Well, I wouldn't have done this or I would have said this if they had done it. See, what the, what the Pharisees would do is they focus on the external actions, but they ignore the internal attitudes. They, they went to, to church, and they put on the, the good uh, um, face or, or facade. But inside, they were as dead as could be. It's why Jesus repeatedly says in the gospel, you have heard, of it, heard them say of old, but I say to you, Jesus wasn't changing the law. Rather, he was interpreting it as it was written. He was saying, you are caring about actions. But what about your motivations? Why do we do what we do? Why do we do it? How we do it? Those two questions matter to God just as much as what we do. It's possible 
and, and indeed probable that many people in our churches will say the right things, sing the right songs, give, uh, do all the right things, but stand before God on Judgment Day and hear it depart from you. And that's not nice, Matthew 7. So what we're talking about is a very heavy matter. So with that being said, what does it mean or what does it look like to love God and to love others? What does love look like? Well, this first and great commandment or from uh, loving God comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Now, Israelites would have been very familiar with that first and great commandment because it's part of what's known as the Shema. And every morning, as the Israelites would get up and begin their day, they would recite the Shema of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And it starts this way. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That is how they start every single day. So they would have understood when Jesus says this is the greatest commandment. This one commandment here is summarizing the first four to five of the Ten Commandments. Remember, no other guys before me. Don't make very good images. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Now, commandment five kind of hinges both ways. It's honor your father and your mother. Okay, it, it is horizontal, obviously, and we have parents who are to obey them. But it's also vertical because honoring our parents is submitting to God-given authority. So when Jesus says, and the second is like it, we're going to come to this, he's really saying 1A, 1B. How you and I relate to others is a good indicator of how we are relating to God. If there's a problem horizontally, it is primarily because there's a problem vertically. Okay, it, it, let's just, let's deal with where uh, the fifth commandment is, honor your father and mother. That days on earth may be long. So if a child is being disrespectful to their parents, ultimately what they're doing is not only being disrespectful to the parents, but ultimately they're rebelling against God. When you and I, as spiritual children of God, when we do not love one another, we are not only sinning against one another, but ultimately we are sinning against God. So what does he mean, love the Lord God, with all your heart? This means that Jesus is to be the supreme love of our life. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, Jesus isn't saying, hate your mom and dad. That would violate scripture. He's not saying, mom and dad, don't love your kids. He's saying that we should love Jesus so much. That he is more precious and valuable to us than our most intimate personal relationships on earth. If we had to choose to upset God or upset an uh, uh, earthly relationship, we choose an earthly relationship every time. Because we will love and honor God above all. The supreme love of our life. To love Jesus with all of our heart means that we are fully committed to him. That there's not an ounce of wiggle room in our life. It's really about lordship. These three are about lordship. Who is the Lord of our life? So then he says, with all your soul. Our soul is what is given to us by God. It's what returns to God upon our death, awaiting the resurrection of the dead. So to love God with all our soul means that we love him so much that we are willing to lose our life for his name and the sake of the gospel. That we don't count our life as important to us. That we understand that God is the one who gave us our life and so when he says it's time for our life to be over, it's over. Again, it is an whole commitment to the Lord. Paul says in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, he says, Nor do I count my life dear myself. Paul says, you know what? 
It's not that I want to die, but at the end of the day, my life isn't that big of a deal. What is a big deal is that I obey God. And then others see Jesus in me. You know, in Matthew 16, if we go back there from last week, Jesus sets up a contrast when he says that you will either lose your life, that if you lose your life for his sake, you'll find the life, or you're trying to save your life for yourself. Part of dying to ourselves daily in Luke 9 it is saying, Lord, you are in complete control of me right now. Whether I live or die through this day, it matters to you. It depends on you. So I'm just going to love you and obey you. Again, there's a question of who is on the throne of our life right now. Who is the one who is in control? So then he says, with all your mind, this speaks of our deepest desire to know God so that we can worship. I want you to imagine a triangle right now. The very top of it is the word no. Down the bottom left is the word love. Bottom right is obey. As I know God, I will love him more. The more I love God, the more I obey God. And the more I obey, the more I know. And it continues to go around. So what we're seeing here, and a lot of times people will come and go, you know, I just don't hear from God anymore. It seems like my prayers are just going to the ceiling and kind of stopping. One of the first questions I'm going to ask them is this. How much time are you spending with God? How much time are you spending daily in prayer and in reading Scripture? Because that is how God has given us to know Him. So as I'm intentional about spending time with Him, I'm going to know Him more which is only going to feel my love and my obedience for him. So here's just some things to, to kind of think about, okay? Do we spend more time watching TV in a given day than we do praying and studying God's Word? Do we spend more time on social media than we do praying and reading God's Word? Now, why do I go there? Because Jesus said in Matthew 6, that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you want to know what's important to a people, uh, to a church, look at how they invest their time. Look how they invest, them, what they invest themselves in. And that will reveal their God to you. And, and so it's, it's an opportunity for us to just kind of pull back and go, okay, is Jesus really the Lord of my life? Do I love him more than any, anyone else? Am I willing to lose my life for the gospel's sake? Am I doing what I need to do so that I can know God, love him, and obey him? Or are there some changes that need to happen in my life right now? So then Jesus says the second is like it, so it's 1A, 1B. Now this second command that comes out of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. So again, it would have been very familiar to them. So my love for others means this, that we delight in serving them. 1 John 4, 20 that we read, that we read earlier. If a man says that he loves God, but he hates his brother, he's a liar. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? To say that I love God, but I don't willfully sacrifice and serve other people means that I'm a liar. Now, most here are probably familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan that Jesus told in the Gospel of Luke. What we often skip over is the why Jesus told the parable. Jesus always tells a parable in response to a question. Now, the question that gave this parable was this. Who is my neighbor? Okay, because again, in the text it says, love your neighbor as yourself. So in there it goes, well, who's my neighbor? Right? He, he was trying to justify who he was loving. The idea is that, well, of course I love you know, those who love me. Why am I going to love those who don't like me? Why am I going to love those who add no value to my life? 
And this is why Jesus is teaching what he is teaching for us. So, for those that may not remember, may not be familiar with this parable, let me summarize. There was this particular man who was outside the city of Jerusalem. And he gets attacked and beaten and left for dead. And so two guys come by, both of them Jewish, both of them would have worked in the temple, all right? One, one was a priest, one was a Levite. Now, when these guys saw the guy basically left for dead, what did they do? Like, they went to the other side and walked around. They didn't want to defile themselves. Because the law said, don't come in contact with a dead body or you're defiled. So they were thinking more of themselves than this poor soul. So then here comes this third guy who is a Samaritan. Now, when I say the word Samaritan, you and I, it's because a lot of times we don't understand what this is. A Samaritan was a Jewish person who married outside of the Jewish race during the captivity. So for a Jewish person, they hated Samaritans. They, they would have liked you and I as Gentiles more than they liked the Samaritans. So Jesus says that this guy is a Samaritan. Now remember, he's talking to a Jewish audience. And he says this Samaritan picks the guy up, takes him to a hotel, gets him cleaned up, bandaged up, and, and pays for the man to stay there. And he says, when I come back, if I owe anything else, I'll pay it. The least likely person in the story does what the Jewish people do should have expected themselves to do. So then Jesus looks at his Jewish audience, and he says, which one of these do you suppose love his neighbor? This would have offended them and just set them off, because a Jewish person would have had to admit that a Samaritan acted more godly. It's kind of like, let's imagine it in a different realm, okay? It would be like a Republican or a Democrat reaching across the aisle in Washington and working with the other party in a way to serve the people who elected them. What? They would, they would lose their minds. Let's bring it home a little bit. It would be kind of like saying today that an atheist knows the Bible and lives it out better than a professing Christian. That's what Jesus just did. Right? I don't bother going to the stone and get rid of him. <clears throat> because he challenged them. Because they said, look at what we do. And Jesus says, I don't have to look at what you do. Because I know who you are. So the question for us right now is, who are we? See, loving your neighbor, according to 1 Timothy uh, one five means doing the right thing, the right way, for the right reasons. But what does this practically look like in our lives? Well, the first thing that I would say is this. It means that we focus on relationships. So if you were to ask most churchgoers uh, of any church, okay, are you a friendly church? How do you think they would respond? Yes, we're absolutely a friendly church. They would probably even get offended that you would dare ask that question. Of course we are. Now, why do, we, why do churches think they're friendly? Because, well, I'm friendly to Dave, and Dave is friendly to me, so we must be a friendly church. <laughs> but the gauge of friendliness is not how the regulars interact. It is how the regulars interact with the new people. With the people that look differently, that's where the gauge of friendliness comes from. How do we treat people then? So I've got a lot of questions this morning. How long do you think it takes the average person to decide whether or not they're going to come back for a second visit to a church? If they're looking for a church home, they're not just on vacation, how long do you think? Three minutes. <coughs> Fifteen minutes. You, you were pretty close there. Fifteen minutes. The average time. Now, that 15 minutes starts when they get out of the car. 
So what this means for the average person before the first song is sung, before the first boring announcement is ever given, and before the first line of the sermon is ever uttered, they have already made up their mind on whether or not they're going to come back for a second. All right. So we're establishing some stuff. So let me ask this question. How long do you think, on average, of that 15 minutes, how many minutes does it take before a visitor new person is spoken to by someone within the church? Eight minutes. Dead on. Eight minutes. This blew me away. That means that over half of the amount of time that they are making a decision on whether they will come back a second time is completely wasted. Loving your neighbor begins in a park. It's a different way to think, but it's deeper than this. See, we have to be intentionally relational in what we do. It's not a matter of putting people out in the park and like, hey, how are you? Because then we, in COVID, we can't walk up to them and hug them and you know, do, do all that stuff. You know, we we got to give them an air high five or a fist bump, an elbow bump, whatever, right? That's not what this is about. It's about not the action, but the inward attitude. Do I want people to love Jesus as much as I love Jesus? Do I, want, do I want them to know who Jesus is to me before they know my political affiliation, uh, my sports teams, my thoughts on the weather, or even my personal preferences on service styles? It's an attitude that begins. Because if it was just about actions, then every church could do two things and radically change. But it's kind of like that diet that, you were, <coughs> that you're telling yourself right now that you're going to start come January because, listen, this is Thanksgiving, but I'm going crazy. <laughs> right? The, the, the thought process is the action that I'm going to take. I'm going to eat better, sleep more, and get more exercise. And it's going to work for a while until the inner attitude of the, the person that got you to the way you are takes over. Because nothing really changed. You changed the actions. But the reason that you do what you do never changed. And this is what we're seeing. It's an intentionality of doing these things. So what does that look like? How often do you sit around different people at a worship service? By the way, let's just be honest. From my vantage point, I can take attendance every single week. Because you sit in the exact same spot. You sit with the exact same people. Now, I, I did this uh, a few years ago. And so a, a small group said, you know what, we're going to mess with him. Okay? And they used to sit on this side. Okay, So what they did the next Sunday, they sat on the far side. The next Sunday, they sat on the far side. Same row, same seat. Just picked at them like, yeah, I still see you over there. Why? Because it's ingrained in us to do the same thing the same way. Because it's comfortable. But following Jesus, loving Jesus, and loving others calls us out of our comfort zone to be selfless, sacrificially serving them. How often do you have people from the church over to your house to get to know them? Maybe share a meal. How often do you invite neighbors, coworkers, or parents or kids on your kids' sports team? How often do you invite them over to your house or go out for a meal just to get to know them? <coughs> See, this is a change of attitude. It's beyond the surface actions. Here's one that's near and dear to our family home. If 
you've been watching Channel 7, you probably didn't see in a lot of these. In Virginia right now, there are about 700 kids who are in the Foster Adopt program. 700. Now, that sounds like a lot, right? And it is. Let me tell you something. The state convention that we belong to, Southern Baptist Convention of Virginia, there are a little over 700 churches in just one convention in this state. By the way, there's about a half a dozen or more conventions across denominational lines. So just with the SBCB, if one family out of every church adopted just one kid, there would be none in the foster adopt program in Virginia. That's loving others as yourself. I get it. It's hard. Our family lived with for, for the last eight years the possibility that the daughter we welcomed into our home that wasn't a cousin to our boys but was a sister, we lived for eight solid years with the knowledge that at any time the course could go crazy and rip her out of our home. To love costs something. Now listen, the only reason that we could do this is because you can go ask my wife. All right, I'm just going to admit this even on Facebook Live Street. There were times where I'm going, what in the world are we doing? Because we were not only putting her in jeopardy, we were putting our own kids in jeopardy. So I went crazy. That's not just one, that's four. Diane, what are we doing? And God's going, didn't I tell you to love others? Sit on shelf and trust them. I don't think you put it that way, but it's that way. <laughs> because love costs something. To love my neighbor means that I got to get past not liking the choices they make. To caring about their soul, which is eternal. Ed Stetcher wrote in his book, Transformational Churches, quote, The purpose of relationships is to see lives change through the power of Christ. We're not friendly just to be friendly. We're friendly for a purpose. We want you to know Jesus. We want to be genuinely friendly because we want to introduce them to Jesus. We want them to know who has the power to change not only their life now, but their eternity. Everything we do, God, be done for the glory of God and pointing people to Christ. You see, if we're struggling to invite people, or if we're struggling to let new people break in, that says more about us than it does them. says we're struggling to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Because to love Jesus is to love those whom Jesus loves. We want to join our lives with others for the purpose of growing closer to God and closer to one another. Our relationships should never be about what can I get out of them, but always what can I get out of them. Because love demands sacrifice. Jesus said in Mark 10, 45, said, don't think that some man has come to be served, but to serve, and give his life as a ransom for me. Paul in Philippians 2 says, don't, don't do anything out of strife or, or envy. Instead, put others' needs in front of your own. Serve them. Let this mind be in you, which is also a Christ. When it comes to people coming into the church, the only stumbling block they should ever encounter is the cross of Jesus Christ. Listen, we know that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.18. We know that it's not going to make sense. But the church should be the most welcoming, embracing, and diverse place on the planet. And yet, many times it's not. Now, I'm not saying water down the Bible. I'm not saying change the Bible. If a person isn't as accepted as they are, and they have to try to break down barriers to be received, it says more about us than it does them. <laughs> we love them where they are, watch this, for two reasons. 
We love them where they are because that's how Jesus loved us and because we want them to know Jesus like we do. This is the biblical mandate. We love them where they are so that we can point them to God so that he can do what only he can do. We love them as Christ loves us. Which then leads us to this. We need to see our need for Jesus in his grace. I have no doubt that this has been a very heavy message. One well, probably just beating you down. I was asking Jesus this point in Matthew 22. Jesus wasn't in the, the business of giving us warm buddies. He was in the business of pointing out sin, not so that he could condemn but so that he could give transforming grace to change. See, no church anywhere in the world is ever going to change on its own unless it's changing the wrong way. Deep, meaningful, lasting change happens only as the people of God see their sinfulness so that we have a clear vision of the redeeming, restoring, transforming grace of Jesus Christ. So the point is not about condemnation, but it's about revealing and reminding that we need Jesus' grace as much as that drug addict out in this life. That we need to be changed and challenged as much as that unfaithful spouse. I don't need you this morning. Because that's not the point. Jesus is point. What is the point his audience to their need for him? He confronts us in our sin so that we can see our need for the Savior who is Christ. Lay it at his feet. Repent of it. Confess your need for his power. Ask God for his help to not just deal with our outward actions, but Lord, reveal to me my inner attitudes. What are the things that God only you see that are causing me not to love you with all my heart, soul, and mind? What are the things, God, that you know about me that are keeping me from loving my neighbor as myself? Search me, O oh God. No. Reveal to me if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This should be our prayer. Because it begins with a true love for God. If you've never experienced the grace of God, then all this talk of love, you only understand it from a worldly perspective. Listen, the idea of the world's love is I'm going to give you something as long as you give me something back. As long as it is beneficial for me, I will do it. The world's definition of love isn't love, it's actually lust. It's I want what I want, how I want it, when I want it, and that's just how it's going to be. But the Bible's definition of love, the example of Jesus Christ, is seen in the King of glory, the eternal God. Stepping down into the world he created with sinful man, living a perfect life for the purpose of laying his sinless life down for sinful man. It is selfless, it is sacrificial, and it is serving. And these are only found in Christ. If you try to do any of those things apart from a relationship, it's going to ring like a bell. How many of you, just real quickly, how many of you have seen the movie Fireproof? Most of you. Okay. You remember uh, the, the main character, the guy, uh, he had a problem, but he wanted to save his marriage. And, and so his dad gave him a little book. It was a 40-day love challenge. And the first 20 days of that challenge, he just went through the motions. One of them was send flowers to, to her worship. 
he got like the ugliest, smallest bouquet possible and, and sent it to her. And he couldn't believe why she didn't go, oh, I love you so much. But then, around day 21 or so, God got a hold of his heart and he changed everything. Now he didn't do the bare minimum. He went above and beyond. And, and so it broke his wife. And she's like, what day are you on? Because she found what it was doing. She was mad. She's like, what day are you on? He's like, 63. She's like, there's only 40. I know I started over. <laughs> Why? Because he finally learned how to love like this. Maybe your marriage is in trouble. Maybe your family is just going down. The answer is not to try harder. It's to love like Jesus. You don't have a horizontal problem. You have a vertical problem. I, I promise you, the word of God is seen. I've seen it in my own life. If you love Jesus the way you're supposed to, you're going to have an easier time loving others the way you're supposed to. So maybe that's what this call this morning is going to be. For some, it might be that you have never. You've never known love, but you want to. So in a moment, we're going to give you a chance to respond. For those watching on the live stream, email me, Pastor Justin, at westlakebaptist.org. I'd love to talk with you today or this week. But maybe for some, it's just being honest. I'm not loving my Jesus. Jesus, I need you. Take stock of where you are right now. How am I loving this right now? Do I freely give grace, mercy, and forgiveness to all or just those like me? Do I desire justice for all or justice for some? Am I loving others by sharing the gospel with them? Or am I just giving lip service to my love for God while watching those around me die and go to hell and never have a good gospel? Are you loving like Jesus? Or do you need to thank the for his grace by spending time on our face? Would you stand with me? We're going to pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. Not because it's easy, but because it's necessary. The reality is, Lord, seldom do we love like we're supposed to. Seldom. Are our inner attitudes and desires where you call them to be? We focus on the outer actions because we want people to think certain things about us. Because it's easier for us to carefully craft a, an image for others to see and to think instead of allow the Holy Spirit to deal with who we really are. Father, what we need is not a new religion. What we need is a new heart. We need a relationship with you. And the good news is, God, you're not asking us to go do it on our own. You're not asking us to, to figure it all out. Because in your love, you went to the cross on our behalf. And you laid down your life for us to show us what love is and to make forgiveness and a relationship with God possible. And so, Lord, I want to pray for each one who's in this room with me, but also those who are watching on this live stream. Father, there's no greater love that we need in our life than the love of God. So if there's anyone who has never experienced, Lord, help today be that day that they see not only their sin, their need, but they see you as the Savior. Help them fall at your feet. To know that you will meet them in their sin. But then you will 
the stone and lavish on them your amazing grace that will not only save them instantly, but that you will spend the rest of their life changing them and making them like you. Father, for my brothers and my sisters who are struggling to love like Jesus. Father, we don't stand and condemn anyone because we ourselves would be condemned. But we do call out, we cry out to them this morning to lay down and carry the church themselves. Father, I am to you. And to know that they have received that redeeming, restoring, and transformative grace that is only found in you. That you will pick us up, forgive us, and allow us to begin to walk with you right where we are. Father, may this next song we sing be more than words on page or screen. May they be the truth of our life. I surrender all. For your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. The author's going to be able to, as we sing two, three verses of this one more.